Well, good morning, everybody. Yeah, it's good to see you. Good to be in the Word together. Good to worship together. The Eukerts plus Bailey was awesome, and God is good. Um, <clears throat> if we could, let's open up our Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, if you haven't already. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the seat back in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, you're free to take that Bible. Make sure it's not someone else's, but the, the ones in the seat back in front of you. It's yours, or give it to a friend. We want to be giving away Bibles. That's a good thing to do. You know, it was really good to uh, finish our study in the book of Daniel last week. Um, so I personally just kept on reading apocalyptic re- literature. I just kept reading Revelation. <clears throat> and uh, because I, I was growing, so I just, that's for me. Uh, we're not going to go into a study of the book of Revelation. Don't worry. I, I know it's like, oh, how much can we take? Um, but if you did miss any of those studies in Daniel, you can go b- to our website, ccfww.org, and you can check, click on messages, and you can find either old ar- audio archive messages, or over the last year since COVID's happened, we've had the video uh, messages on, which you can check out. Um, obviously, they're just a means of edification, so be blessed there. But this morning, we're going to begin a seven-week study, just a topical study, basically, even though it's going to be verse by verse, through the uh, letters to the seven churches found in Revelation chapter 1 and 2. Um, so please, if you haven't already, turn there to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be in verse, verses 1 through 7 this morning. And it says, A letter written uh, from the Lord through the Apostle John to the church in Ephesus. And I'm going to read those verses for us as we begin. It says in uh, Revelation 2, 1, It says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and you can't and you uh, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know that you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary. Verse 4, but I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet, this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will grant thee to eat the tree, of the, uh, the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Lord, we come before your throne, we come before your word, and we ask, God, that you would give us those ears to hear what your spirit is saying to your church here in 2021 in Walla Walla. Lord, we ask that our hearts would be softened, that our ears would be opened, that we have spiritual hunger and thirst for righteousness given to us by you, and and that we would not only hear, but act upon it, God. Do a great work in this church in the coming months, Lord, in the coming days, until we see you face to face, Lord. And we just pray for that work. We pray for our own hearts individually, but us collectively as your body, Lord, that we would grow in our love for one another, our love for you. And uh, God, the things that we're doing well, Lord, we pray that you'd strengthen them and we continue in them. And the things that need to be adjusted, Lord, we just ask that you give us uh, the grace to repent, and that we would obey you in these things. And so we, we lift this up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, real quickly, to give you a quick overview of, cha- of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, there are, sp- there are specific letters written to specific churches from the Lord. They're penned by the Apostle John uh, to be given to the various elders of these seven churches, or seven leaders of these various churches. We know that Revelation was written um, just the entire book was written sometime after the fall of Jerusalem. So some, like Jesus died around 33 AD. I'm, I'm really somewhere right around there. But around in 70 AD, which Jesus prophesied, Jerusalem got devastated by the Romans. Titus came in, wiped out the whole place. The Jews were dispersed at that time. And so this was written. All the apostles had kind of left and gone different places. So this is probably written around 96 AD. So the end of the first century, basically. And we also know from Revelation chapter 1 that the Apostle John at the time of the Revelation, he's on a rock island, basically, which is a a slave colony called Patmos. It's just this 
island where people just bust rocks because they're in trouble for something. And it's around 60 miles off the coast of Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. And so uh, he was imprisoned there for, te- for preaching the gospel. That's why he was there. We find that from Revelation chapter 1. He's 90 years old, and he's pounding rocks for the gospel. And it was there on Patmos that John hears the voice of the Lord. He was caught up on the Lord's day or on the day of the Lord, and he's given this apocalyptic vision, just like Daniel. Kind of, Daniel is kind of, uh, John is the Daniel of the New Testament, so to speak. These guys are parallels. And so John is given this apocalyptic vision that we know as the book of Revelation. He was told by the Lord to write down uh, what he sees in verse 19. He says, what you see, uh, what you just saw, basically what you're going to see and what's going to come. That's the key to understanding Revelation if you want to go study it, verse 19, because it's broken up into those three parts. But he says to write it down, write down, and then send it to the seven churches that I'm going to tell you about. And he lists them there in chapter 1, verse 11. If you flip back a page, it says the churches are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so these were real churches, real people, real leaders. These aren't pretend things. These aren't allegorical. They were real churches, real people gathered together in a real city, saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, much like us. Now, we have a lot of churches in Walla Walla, but back then it didn't, didn't go denominational quite then. There was the church that gathered in Ephesus. And of course, they had house churches all over the place and all that type of stuff, but there was the church, the gathering, and they were under, they were all together. They had elders. It was an organized deal there. And so um, the Lord is writing to these churches. And then in chapter 1, ver- uh, 1 verse 12, uh, John quickly turns to see who's speaking to him. I'm jumping around a little bit, but uh, John turns to see who's speaking to him. So he hears hear this amazing voice that sounded like, waters, uh, like the ocean, and, he's, and he turns to see, and it's recorded for us there in chapter 1, verse 12, and this gives us the context of who's writing these things, so I think this is important for us to know. Um, it says, turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. This is, you guys are remembering this from Daniel chapter 10, very similar vision. I read this. But gold sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were were white, like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice like the roar of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its full strength. And so this is the Lord Jesus Christ the head of the church, the head of Ephesus, the head of this church right now. And John sees him, and in verse 17 it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, just like Daniel, right? But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. Now real quickly, Jesus Christ is, He's not only the Son of God, He is God the Son. I want to clarify that right now. In the Old Testament, the first and the last is, a, is in Isaiah 48, something or other, somewhere right around there. He says, listen, I am the first and the last. There is no other. I'm the only God. That's me. There's no one else. And right here we read, Behold, this one who says he is the first and the last. Well, when I saw him, I fell at his feet, but he laid his right hand on me and said, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Well, who's that? Well, that's God. Well, what about God? Verse 18. And the living one, because I died, and therefore I am alive forevermore. And have the keys of death and hell. When did God die? When did the first and the last die? On the cross, the Son of God, God the Son, one and the same. And I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades, that is hell. Write, therefore, verse 19, write, therefore, the things that you have seen, what you just saw, those that are, the letters to the churches, and those that are about to take place after this, the apocalyptic things that are coming on the church. And so John is now told, write this down. 
And the Lord starts off by explaining some, uh, he starts off by saying in verse 20, uh, basically, as, as for the mystery of the seven stars, John starts explaining what he just saw, because it was explained. He says, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is going to be important. The reason why I'm doing this backdrop is, is, is you see the Lord in all his glory, but he has seven stars in his right hand, and he's walking amongst seven lampstands. Well, what is all that? That's pertinent to the letters we're reading, because those seven stars are seven angels, and the seven lampstands, we're told, are the seven churches, Okay? We're going to see this in just a second. But the word angel, it means messenger. And it's really important when we're interpreting the Bible that we, we don't just start going, oh, Jesus is writing to angelic beings. That's silly. He's not writing to angelic beings. The word angel means messenger. You have to know the context of what he's talking about. The context gives you the the definition. And so what many believe, including myself, is he is writing to the angels or the messengers of those churches. Who would that be? The elders or the pastor over those churches that he holds in his hand. That's what's going on there. And so he has the, the pastors, the leaders, the elders, whoever they are, in his hands who are called to minister to those churches. And notice He's talking to them, and he's going to tell them what's good and what's bad and what they need to correct and what they do, right? Because who's going to be accountable? Yeah. In greater, in one respect. They must give an account, we read in Hebrews. This is why many, include myself, they believe these are not angels. He's not writing a letter to angels. He's writing to the messengers of the churches, the elders there. And of these seven churches, and the Lord is seen, they're also walking in the midst of these seven lampstands. What does that mean? What does that imply? That the Lord is among what? His churches. He's walking among them. What are we? Who is He? With eyes of fire. He's walking among these churches at that time, these seven churches, real people, real trials, real tribulation, real things going on in their life. Real elders, real cities. And the glorified Son of God was in their midst. What did he see? The Lord's going to dictate to John those seven letters. He's going to write seven specific letters, one to each of the churches. And then he's going to go ahead and, 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 write, and he's going to tell John, listen, I'm going to give you the whole entire book of Revelation. And I want you to give it to all the churches. But embedded in that are going to be letters to individual churches. So everybody's going to read everybody else's letters. That's what's going to go on. And one letter for one is going to be edifying for all. That's the purpose there. But I'm writing to you about specific things. He's writing to those people, and John is going to call those seven elders to Patmos, and he's going to give them seven hand copies of the book of Revelation. He's going to say, go read this to your church. This is from the Lord. And these letters are an evaluation. The specific letters in chapters 2 and 3 are an evaluation of the Lord's time among his churches of what he sees going on, what's good, what's awesome, what's commendable, and what needs to be changed. Unless we begin divorcing ourselves from this, these guys 2,000 years and go, oh, well, that's great for them. Again, those letters were written for those churches, but they were to be shared for the churches. And those churches represent, I would say, throughout time, all the churches of Christ. You can kind of look at all these different churches Although they were real churches at real time, you could look at any one of those and kind of see a cross-section of his church today. And boy, I tell you, you read that. And may these things penetrate our hearts. May we be quickened as we read these letters to those churches and lest we think, oh, you know, that's just dealing with them. I, I don't got that issue. And 
And so the question is for us, as we go through these seven-week series, kind of, it's going to be broken up here because we've got Easter and some other things going on, but the question for us in that seven-week series is, what is the Spirit saying to the church? What is He saying to the church? What is He saying to us? And do we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church? Do we have ears? Do we have spiritual ears? Do we have spiritual understanding? And so John is commanded by the Lord there in all his glory in chapter 2, verse 1, to write. And he begins writing to the first church. He says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. And what John would do, uh, he summons the letters and he's going to hand them off and they're going to start reading each other's mail. (laughs) And they're going to go, oh boy. I think it's going to be like one of those situations while they're all in the upper room going, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Is it me? But this first church addressed here is is in verses 1 through 7 is the church of Ephesus. Ephesus was a large city. It wasn't the capital, but it was pretty pretty awesome. It was in modern-day Turkey. And the church in Ephesus seems to have been started in some part by a, a husband-wife team, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. I don't know who's who. I think Priscilla's the guy and Aquila is the girl because um, that's the way they're named. But uh, he, uh, they had been working with Paul for a while. Paul was a, um, Paul was a tent maker, and they had walked alongside with him when they met him, and they had worked together, and so they, they knew the Lord. They had a bond. But anyways, they were in um, they were in Ephesus eventually, and in Acts 18, verses 24 through 28, you can read about Ephesus in Acts 18, 19, and 20. That's where you will find out about Ephesus. I'm not going to go into a great deal about this, but it tells us that a Jew named Apollos comes upon Ephesus, and he, is, he was eloquent, and he was competent, and he knew the Old Testament, and he knew the things concerning Jesus in general, but he only knew the baptism of John. And so we read that Priscilla and Aquilum took him under his wing and taught him more accurately concerning the Lord Jesus. And so he was awesome. He blessed. He taught there, wherever that was. If they had a group of people there, it seemed like they did, because then he left and went to a place called Acacia, or Achaia, uh, and uh, the church blessed him and sent him out there from Ephesus. But then in Acts, in Acts 19, we read that the apostle Paul, on his third journey, he shows up in Ephesus. He finds 12 people who just know the baptism of John, which is all about repentance in preparation for the Messiah, and as he's reading that, what ha- I mean, as he's talking to them, th- Paul explains more fully about the gospel to them. They understand, they receive the Lord, they're baptized with the Holy Spirit, and basically I think that's where the church really takes off there. And so Paul preaches to them, they believe, they're baptized, they receive the Holy Spirit, and basically the church in Ephesus takes off. And it's then that Paul enters into the synagogue and he teaches for three months. And a lot of Jews are being converted there, because remember, he preaches to the Jew first, then the Gentile. The Jews are kind of following along, but then he gets a lot of resistance. Then he leaves there, he goes to the hall of Tyrannus, because he, he's getting too much trouble from the Jews, and he just starts preaching openly to anyone, Jew, Gentile, doesn't make a difference who, who, who comes in. He's just preaching the gospel. For two years, he does this. And it says in Acts 19.10 that all the residents of Asia, Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. All the residents of Asia, this is Asia Minor, Turkey, like it just spread like wildfire. And there's a reason why. Because God had done some amazing works of grace at that time through Paul in Ephesus so that Paul, when Paul, if Paul touched a handkerchief, like and people touched their their handkerchief, they got healed. If it's like shadow crossed, crossed, uh, crossed them, they would be healed. I mean, God's grace was just amazingly powerful, at, powerfully at work through Paul at that time. And the interesting thing, as today, is people try to replicate that stuff. There's the sons of Sceva's that come on, on the scene, and they start saying, hey, you know, we can, we can cast out things, and then all of a sudden the demons jump in. I'm not getting, you know, this is, you got to read for yourself, okay? I'm not going to reteach the whole thing. The demons jump and say, hey, we know Paul, we know the Lord, we don't know you, and they tore him apart, and basically everybody's in fear because they go, wow, as the gods of their age, as the powers that be, as all the things that they had started to worship, they started to be shown for what they truly were. They were powerless compared to the God of Paul the Apostle. And Paul sits there and doesn't preach himself, he preaches Christ crucified, risen from the dead. And people are abandoning their stuff This is a totally idolatrous culture. I don't know if you can imagine it or not. (laughs) 
massive work of the Lord. In verse 20, it says, The word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily in Ephesus. The word of the Lord kept going. What is the word of the Lord? The gospel concerning Jesus Christ. And I say all this to say that the gospel was impacting Ephesus so dramatically that it was affecting the economy, the economy that was built around idol worship. They were getting mad because people started abandoning all their junk. The things they had picked up in the world, they started burning their albums and getting rid of their idols and throwing away their magic books and just giving up all this stuff to start to follow Jesus Christ because they realized all that stuff was counterfeit. It was nothing. God did a massive work in people's hearts. And the people who were thoroughly entrenched in making money in that system, particularly a guy named Demetrius, who was a silversmith, he gathers all business leaders because their profits had gone way down. All the idle selling and all that stuff had gone way down in Ephesus. They were mad because Diana or Artemis, interchangeable guy, girl, that's what happens there when you start to worship false gods, started to go down. Their worship started to go down. And they weren't selling as many idols and all this type of stuff. Verse 19 says, A number of those who practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them inside of all, and they continued. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Whatever that was back, in, back then, that's a lot now. So people were abandoning all these things. They were abandoning sexual immorality. They weren't going to the temples anymore in, in, a, in, a, in a very radical sense. They were so wrapped up in this culture that the Lord radically delivered them. They became a witness to the Ephesians. There was a dividing going on as the sword of the word came. People were radically being saved out of a very satanic stronghold that they didn't even realize they were in until the light came bursting forward. So much so, it affected so much so that a riot started by that guy Demetrius who got all the business leaders and said, yeah, we're, we're done with this. And he riled up the, the people in, in the city, and there was a lot who followed. Yeah, obviously, not everybody got saved, but there was a, enough that was affecting things. And they got together, and they were crying out, long live, or whatever it was. And finally, they, they yelled, basically, uh, greatest, great, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. They cried it out for two hours straight at the top of their lungs in this riot. Finally, a governor guy comes out and says, hey, you got to knock this off, otherwise you guys are going to go to jail, basically. Finally, they were quieted and left. So that's Ephesus. This is the church that's born there. These are the people that, that, that were brought into that church, came out of prostitution, came out of idol worship, came out of magic arts, came out of all this kind of stuff, and God radically saved them. They're gathered together. How many of you have been radically saved by the Lord? God just, 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 just did amazing things in your life, and like you abandoned stuff. If you haven't, it's a pretty good time to start abandoning stuff. And just to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. These people love the Lord because he who's been forgiven much, what? Loves much. They love the Lord. They knew dark. They knew light. They knew the old life. They knew the new life. It changed them. Jesus was real. He was their God. He was everything for them. And not he wasn't pretend he was powerful. Powerful enough to save them out of what they were entrenched in. And so the believers in Ephesus, this precious group of people are being written to by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord lets them know as he's writing, in verse 1, he says, the words of him, he lets them know who's writing, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Again, the Lord's identifying himself as, listen, your leader's in my hand, I'm sovereign, and I'm walking among you. I'm here, I'm present. And as he walks among them, he begins to tell them what he sees. Verse 2, he says, I know your works. I know, and that word for know isn't like, hey, I know, I've heard about. It means I intimately, absolutely, thoroughly understand and know more than you do. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance 
and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found themselves to be false. And I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. How many of you kind of identify with that group, man? You love the word, you hate evil, and you feel like you've been through a lot, and you're just weary but you keep going, you love the Lord, you haven't given up, you keep doing the right thing. How many of you fall into that group? Lord says, I know it to them. I see it. I've been walking among you. I know your works. He tells them, I know it. And these things are things that are commendable. Specifically, he says, I know your works. These are the general things we've been called to do as believers. Remember Ephesians 2.10 uh, you are his workmanship in Christ Jesus created to do good works for which he prepared before you to do before the foundations of the world. He saved you to walk in the good works that he prepared for you to walk in. And they were walking in these things. It was awesome. And he says, listen, I see your works. And that's a general sense. And then he got, starts to get specific. He says, listen, I see your toil. Not just like, hey, I went to work today, but toiling. Toiling means that you are working to the point of exhaustion. You are sweating. You are to the point of, it can be physical exhaustion, it can be mental exhaustion, it can be emotional exhaustion. He says, I see that you toil. That's what this church was. They were toiling in the things of the Lord. They didn't just sit and listen. They were engaged. Their faith worked. And it worked hard. Amen? Amen? They heard what the Word said, and they lived up to it, to the point of exhaustion. This was an all-in church. Amen? And not only did they toil in their work for the Lord, they patiently endured that word is hupomony in the Greek, which means to endure trying super, uh, circumstances. They endured trying circumstances. I know so many of you have been through trying circumstances this past year. I know collectively we have been through trying circumstances, but individually, I mean, it is overwhelming. People have been through trying circumstances this week, this, this, week, this year. You don't know how many, t I mean, you all maybe have talked to me, but I don't know if you've all talked to each other, but y'all got issues going on. They're trying. Loved ones who've passed away. Difficulties at work. Mask, no wet mask. I mean, just little things that all, all this kind of stuff, just what do you do at your job and how do you relate to stuff and then being alone for so long and trying to engage, all this kind of stuff. Trials are going on in your lives. And I'm not going to go into much more specifics, but, and they said they patiently endured this isn't about abandoning hope. It means they continue to trust in the Lord even in overwhelming circumstances. Another thing that the Lord saw in them is that he, that he commended is they did not tolerate evil men. They did not tolerate evil men. Boy, man, we've got a problem with tolerating evil in our own lives and around us and in the church. This was a church who did not tolerate evil men. It was a holy church, set apart. That's a good thing, unless the culture tells you differently. We don't conform to the world, we conform to the Lord. Amen? Are we patient with one another? If we see a brother in sin, do we restore them gently? Yes, all those things, of course. But we're not the church that sits around like Colosh, you know, uh, the uh, Corinthians and says, hey, look at we got someone sleeping with their mother-in-law. Aren't we tolerant? And that, and that happened in the Bible. Paul had to address that. No, they couldn't handle that stuff. They had to deal with it because they knew it grieved the Lord. And they knew how it would affect the church. In other words, this is a well-taught church. Think about it. Apollos comes on the scene. Apollos is no small joke. The guy was awesome. I mean, he was eloquent. He taught the scriptures. You see that. Paul even talks about it in Corinth. Listen, I came along. Apollos... Well, I, I laid the groundwork and Apollos watered. They worked as a team. Apollos comes in. You've got Priscilla and Aquila doing home church. You've got Apollos coming in and teaching. And then you've got Paul the Apostle for two years. 
teaching you. How would you like that? Yes, please. Sign me up for that home group. Anyone? It's like, I'm going. See you guys later. And then Paul leaves and he sends Timothy. Timothy hangs out and he teaches the church and this is why Paul writes to him and says, listen, you got to do all this stuff. Then beyond Timothy, you've got other guy, Tychicus, or some other guy comes in. And then lastly, guess who comes in and, and pastors this church? The Apostle John. The Apostle John himself, John the Apostle comes in and pastors this church. Talk about awesome teaching. Talk about direct revelation from the Lord. Talk about like all your questions answered with no like, yeah, I want to be a part of that church. They had awesome teaching. They knew the truth. They knew the word. It permeated them. This wasn't like the church in Hebrews, where Paul said, hey, or whoever the writer of Hebrews is, sorry, I showed my cards there, said, hey, you should all be teachers right by now. But you aren't. I've got to come back and teach you the elementary things. You can't chew on solid food, because solid food is for the mature, who by chewing on it, under, they grow to discern good and evil. And so Paul uses the analogy of those who go on from the simple basic doctr doctrines, which we all start out with, and he lays them out there. Moving on to the deeper things of Christ, the maturity of Christ. And those, we're now able to discern good and evil. That's what a mature person does. A lot of churches can't do that. They don't know that. They aren't taught. They don't have it. A lot of people in those churches don't have it because they will not grow. This is why the New Testament pushes us towards this. This is what the apostle does. is pushing us constantly towards maturity so that we know how to live righteously in an unrighteous world, so we know how to glorify God in this day and age in the church. Amen? That church knew how to do that. They would not tolerate evil men. Case in point, they tested those who called themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. One of the most scary things is how do you know if someone's leading you astray if you don't know yourself? This is a scary thing. This church was a mature church. They understood those things. They knew when someone was teaching something was off. How many of you know when someone's teaching something was off? You just go, eh, that's weird. Oh, they're playing to my emotions. Oh, they want my money. Or, you know what? What they're saying and what they're doing are two different things. You, 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 know, you know that, right? You've seen it kick up. They are a very discerning church. People were walking in saying, I'm an apostle. Paul had to address this, false apostles. You know, it wasn't like he could just call in. He was away. And people crept into the church and they started teaching all this junk. And he had to send people, make sure people were there, to, things were protected. Because wolves were coming in. Actually, if you read in chapter 20, as he's leaving, he has, gathers all the Ephesian elders there together and they are all weeping because they love him so much. He says, listen, as soon as I go, ravenous wolves are going to come in. They're going to try to tear you apart. I'm committing you to the word. And then he later sent Timothy in. So this was a church that was able to sit there and say, yeah, you guys aren't apostles. Get out of here, turkey. Praise God for that. The church had a 40-year history up to this point. They were 40 years old when this letter was written. They weren't erring in doctrine, and I say all that because the Lord commends them, and he repeats it again in verse 3. He says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And really, if there's a banner over all of these letters for us, it's for his name's sake. Anything we do, anything that needs to be corrected, anything we aspire to, anything we move towards, anything we're, that we're, we're convicted of, anything that we need to repent of, anything that we're encouraged in, for his name's sake. Amen. That's why Daniel was grieved when he looked at what Israel was not doing. It's because of his name's sake. Jerusalem was in ruins. The people were not back in the land and all these things. And he cried out to the Lord and was weeping to him. And that's where he received the answers. We already went over all this, but it's for his name's sake. But how awesome it must have been to be in that church, to hear the commendation from the Lord as they read that letter, huh? The Lord knows what we've been through. How encouraging is that? The Lord saw that. He was pleased in their maturity and their discernment and their perseverance and their desire to live pure and holy in such an unholy culture. But verse 4, but I have this against you. 
that you have abandoned the love you had at first. You have abandoned the love you had at first. How deeply must have that, that must have stung to read that from the Lord. You've got all this right. You've got it all down, but guess what? You've abandoned the love you had at first. You've got correct doctrine. You're intolerant of evil. You've got mature believers going on. Except for the fact that somewhere along the line, you abandoned the love that you once had. He didn't say you kind of have it. He said what? You abandoned it. What do you do when you abandon something? You ditch it and you put it out of the way and you don't even think about it. They had it right. They did all the right things. They knew the right things, but something was not right. They abandoned their first love. What does this mean? Think about it. They were radically saved. What did they do when they were radically saved? They left all the world. They left all those things. What do you think their, love, their life was now devoted to? The Lord. Do you think it was a drag for them to go to church? Do you think it was a drag for them to get together? Do you think it was a drag for them to give? Do you think it was a drag for them to hang out with one another? Do you think anything could keep them from being together? Do you think anything could keep them from evangelizing? Do you think anything could keep them from doing the things that God had called them to do? Do you think, you know, when, the, when they started singing together, do you think everybody was like, oh, this amazing grace. They were in love with the Lord. They loved him. When you love something, it shows in your time, talent, treasure. It shows in what you do and how you act and what you do and, and the energy you do it with. The gospel is on their lips night and days. It was not mechanical, church. It was not mechanical. It was love. And by the way, it wasn't often doctrine either. It wasn't an emotional thing, but those things met together. Right doctrine, right practice, right heart. All met together. Ephesus was an awesome church. Love for the Lord. Jeremiah in his ministry to Israel said much of the same thing to, to, um, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, when the Lord was dealing with Israel. Remember, Israel is just about to go into exile within the next 20 years, right? And he says to him, hey, I remember the devotion of your youth. He's talking to Israel. I remember you when you were young. Remember your devotion towards me when you were young? Your love as a bride. How you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. You follow me anywhere. You would follow me anywhere. How many of you, how many, I mean, I'm just asking my own question, my, myself this own question. If the Lord said, follow me, where you, would you go? To a land not shown, a land not sown, a land you don't know. Do you love the Lord? They just follow the Lord anywhere. To, into any situation. Share with them there. Share with that person. Okay, I'll go and go in, Lord. I love you more than my own life. I love you than my own reputation. Give here. Do this. Go there. Be a part. Just spend time with me. Abandon that. Forget that. Follow me. Trust me. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. In other words, they, their lives were set apart to him, Jeremiah says there. They were his first fruits. He walked into the garden and and it was the fruit that he enjoyed, much among the li like the light of the lampstands. He walked into the garden, inspected the fruit, and said, you're for me, and I'm here to enjoy you. The reason why you're here, the reason why you've, you've grown, the reason why you've been planted, the reason why you've been nurtured is for my enjoyment. And your pleasure, your fullness, your joy is found in me loving you and you loving me. That's the relationship we've been brought into with God, a relationship of love. But you see, they were doing all the right things, but they had abandoned the first love of the Lord like a marriage that becomes mechanical and cold. So what's the counsel that the Lord gives? What did God say to do? What's the answer? Three R's. Write them down. 
Three R's. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence you have fallen. Repent and, I'll say, redo the works you did at first. Remember, repent, redo. That is to say, they must, first of all, he says, to remember, right? How do you get out of a loveless relationship? You don't get out of it, you get into it. Remember. Remember, therefore, he says, you have to remember. This is to say they must recognize what has happened. Recognize from where you've fallen. Look at where you are now. Realize where you are. Where you were and where you are. Look at where you are now in relation to where you should be. To your first love, right? Remember. Remember the love you had for the Lord when you came to the Lord. How your life was just totally built around him and everything you did was for him. And, and it was just the Lord day and night. That was a choice of yours. Did you know that? You actually chose to do those things? Do you follow the Lord? What happened? We abandoned him along the way, one thing at a time. One idol replacement at a time. And then all of a sudden our hearts became mechanical and cold. You got to remember where you've fallen from. Go back. And say, this is where I need to be. Remember where you need to be. With him, number one. He says, remember, and secondly, after remember, the Lord calls them to to repent. So it's not good enough just to recognize. It's not just good to see where you've been, the things, the works that you've first done and all that stuff, where you've fallen from. But you've got to repent. You've got to turn from what you're doing now and turn towards the Lord. That's what repent does. Change your heart. Change your mind, change your actions to line up with what the Lord says. That's what repenting does, is. There has to be a willful change of mind and direction. Choose to turn to God and away from sin. Choose to abandon your sin. Choose to abandon your lovelessness of God. And now choose to follow the Lord. Does that make sense? This is what he says. Now, some of you might be going, I I don't know if I can do that. Of course you can't. God's calling you to do it. If he's calling you to do it, do you think he's going to empower you to do it when you obey him? The answer is yes. I've used it before. Like he told the man who had the messed up arm, he said, stretch out your hand. And everybody in there goes, well, he can't. It's ruined. Jesus didn't say, hey, like, I understand your arm is messed up and we've got to work through this and do some counseling, so stretch out your arm. When he obeyed what the Lord said, what happened? He was healed. Just repent, turn, choose to follow the Lord and he will strengthen you as you go. He'll help you. Amen? Encouraging, isn't it? And then, so there must be this willful choice to move away from their sin and move towards God. And then, in doing so, thirdly, redo. That is to do the works that you did at first. What does that look like? Well, what did they do when they first came to the Lord? They were devoted to Him. Read Acts 2. They got their heart in line with his will. What does God want you to do? He wants you to be around the people of God. He wants you to be a part of the things of God. He wants you to pour your heart into him, to pray to him, to seek him, to give, to follow, to worship, to evangelize, to share. So put him first. Redo prayer. Redo fellowship. Redo sharing in their life. How is, how is prayer going on in your life? And I'm not saying this to, I'm just doing a cross-section here of just the things that functionally happen in the church, right? The things that can become mechanical and cold, but actually which are supposed to be an outflowing of love for the Lord. But how many of us have abandoned these things because we haven't put the Lord first in our life? Put the Lord first and then start doing the right things by showing that in redoing prayer. Pray. Begin to pray again. Pray with others. Pray with people in the church. Pray alone. Pray in your head. It sounds like Dr. Seuss which I, 
Never mind. <laughs> Redo fellowship. Who do you fellowship with? You know, I love that picture MacArthur has of, you know, he's talking to some guy. He said, listen, I'm alone, I'm is- isolated. Man, this year's been a, a alone and isolating year if you let it. What did Jesus say to do the church? Stay away from each other for a year? No, gather together. Don't let fear rule you. Be smart about things. You can put on a mask and stay art, but be, choose to be, to be with one another, right? Choose to be with one another. Don't let the world tell you how to be the church. That's Jesus' role. Jesus says be together. So what do you do? You figure it out. And you also love one another while you're doing it. Some of us are a little bit more sensitive about things that are going on than others. Respect one another in that, right? As best you can. But commit to be one another. I mean, what if they told you, hey, you can't be with your spouse for a year? That would be unacceptable, right? Well, come on, say yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Saw some of you kind of joking. Turkeys. We need each other. Why? Because Jesus said we do. He brought us into one family. You're my brothers and my sisters. When Jesus was brought, his mother, he, Jesus was preaching and he had his, his, he was teaching and all this stuff and they were in a crowded room. His mother and his brothers were trying to come in and they, and they said, hey, your mother and brother's here. You gotta stop everything. You know, let them come in and all this stuff. And he goes, who are my, who's my mother and who's my brother? The ones who hear and do the will of my father, those are my brothers and my mother. He wasn't dismissing his love for his mom. He had his love for his mom. But what he was letting the the people know is, that's your family. These are the people that you devote your life to, the church. You get into one another's life. You love one another. we got to redo fellowship, church, because Jesus says that's what we need. By the way, the, the, the analogy that MacArthur gave is like it's a bunch of coals. When they're together, they're hot. When they're spread out, they get cold. Got to push them back together again. We do sharing evangelism. Share the Lord with people. Mess it up. Just do it. <laughs> Learn as you go. How many of you learned soccer and just like, we're just like the stud goal, you know, the stud goalie or the, or the awesome forward like the first time you played soccer or whatever it was. I'm using a horrible analogy. Just, that's why I don't use analogies. <laughs> No, you learn as you go, and God teaches you as you go, right? That's the exciting part of it. We do giving. How many of us have become inward, selfish, fearful, holding on instead of trusting, giving? I'm not just saying, hey, now, let's pass the plate and let's have a moment. Your time, your talent, your treasure, giving your life to the Lord, right, for His purposes, right? Amen? I'll let the Spirit speak to you on all that stuff. And by the way, you have been given. God is good, but... I. You know what we're saying. We do worship. Sing to the Lord. Don't sing about Him. Sing to Him. Right? These are things I'm preaching to myself. We do asking for forgiveness. When you first came to the Lord, man, there was a lot of asking for forgiveness going on. When did that stop? How many of you just all of a sudden got real good at life? More forgiveness. It's a constant reminder in my household to constantly ask for forgiveness, not let things slip. Redo forgiving others. Seek out those who offended you. How many of you have let them just go by the wayside instead of seeking them out? Remember when you first came to the Lord and how your hearts were pierced when there was a broken relationship and you couldn't stop until that was fixed because that's the Lord in you? How many of you just shut that off and just abandoned that and it became hard and cold and you just live with that callousness now? That is unacceptable in the church of God. Jesus doesn't want to hang around a loveless church. There's forgiveness going on. There's adequate forgiveness. The cross. How about redo burning your idols? So to speak. Now, don't get in trouble. You know what I'm talking about. You know, in Corinthians, Paul was talking to them and he said, listen, Don't let the lump 
uh, don't let the yeast ruin the whole lump. He says, you're a new lump. And what would happen is, you know, to make bread, they would take part of an old lump of dough and they would save it before they baked it and that would be the starter for the next one. The sour dough would become sour, it'd become putrefied. Then you put it in the next one and it putrefies the whole another lump. And he's saying, listen, you've been born again. You're a new lump. Don't let the old life infect the new life. And what would happen is they had the feast of Passover or, you know, and they would go around and inspect their house and they would look for leaven in their house. That's what the Jews do or are supposed to do today. They found a way around it and then they go to a different hotel or they do something that's kosher for the week and they go back to their house. It's like, no, the purpose is you inspect your house and your life for a week and you get the stuff out, the sin out. You look for the leaven, you kick it out. How about we redo burning our idols? Lord, help me. Help us, Amen pure and holy church. What is Jesus doing as he's walking around us as, as this church? You see what I'm saying? I'm, can, are anybody else convicted? But isn't it also awesome as the Lord starts to convict that he comes and cleanses? There's a lot of great things going on. We're not saying that, but the Jesus is like, these are awesome things. I know you're going through hard times. I know you know the word. I know all this stuff, but I want a love-filled church. And there's things that are in the way of love. You got your love in some other things. The three R's, remember, repent, redo. And if they would not do those, a fourth would happen. We're almost done here. A fourth R would happen. You don't want to get here. If not, verse five, middle part of verse five, I will come to you and what? Remove your lampstand from its place unless you what? Repent. See, the one thing about being the Lord is that he is what? He's the Lord. (laughs) He's the Lord of the church. And he can remove lampstands. What does that mean? That Ephesus would die. The church would no longer exist because he would not allow that church to continue in the state it was, even with all those good things going on. If you do not, then I will come and I will do this. And he means business. That means the Lord can judge his church. And this is not the end. This is present. He can judge his church. In verse 6, unless their hearts get too heavy with sorrow, he sandwiches. Anybody know about the sandwich? You tell them some good things about you, then you tell them the things that are wrong, then you tell them some more good things about them. Well, luckily, that, uh, if he, you know, the Ephesians have the sandwich. Some of them just have like an open-faced, it's bad. Um, but verse 6 says, yet, th- <laughs> yet this you have. You hate the words of the Nicolaitans, which I hate also. One of the six... Um, one of the seven guys, remember in Acts chapter 6, basically says, hey, uh, you know, we've got a problem with the distribution of bread. The apostles were waiting tables. He says, choose six men from among you, or seven men among you, filled with the Holy Spirit. He gives them all these things. One of those guys was named Nicholas. Church history says one of them became an apostate, started following some wacky teaching, using the, saying that the liberty in Christ was a means for license to do weird stuff and so he could say christians could be involved in orgies and god's grace would cover them and all this kind of stuff it was just really really weird and so apparently they knew this guy was on the scene and his followers the nicolaitans were around and he says you hate their deeds you've got that for you he says i hate it too do you know the lord hates some things this is one of them and so the lord says you have that going for you and then an exhortation and a promise, verse 7. Let's just quickly finish it up. He was an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. What kind of ear is he talking about? A physical ear? Spiritual ear, right, Daniel? Did you just hear what the Lord said this morning in his word to his church? Are you listening to him? Am I listening to him? Boy, that's a grace in itself. If we can actually hear what he's saying to his church, that is amazing. You don't know how many people listen to this stuff and it goes right over their head. They pay no attention. Did you hear what he said to you? It's it's heavy. Jesus in Matthew 7, 24 says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man who builds his house on a rock. Not only hear, you can hear them spiritually, but you actually what? You do it. You do it. And Jesus says here, notice again, 
in verse 7. Who's he speaking to? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the what? To the who? Is that singular or plural? Oh boy. They're reading each other's mail. We're reading their mail. Yeah, that's up. That's us. Not just for the Ephesians, but for Christ Community Fellowship in Walla Walla 2021. Did you hear what the Lord Jesus just wrote to his church in Ephesus 2,000 years ago? Are you seeing what he might say to us as he has walked around us and been around us? To the one who conquers, and he says, now here's the promise. To the one who conquers, the one who overcomes, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. These are pictures for eternal life. Now, wait a second. I thought I had eternal life when you believed in Jesus Christ. There's something about the Lord that he put, always puts the tension in our faith in that when we believe we're saved, but we're also being saved, the scriptures say, and the, and the scriptures also say we will be saved. So what is it? Yes. When we're saved, we are saved from the penalty of sin. We're being sanctified, which means we're being saved from the power of sin. And on that day, we will be saved from the presence of sin. Amen? Salvation is a big picture. And those who are Christ persevere. How do you persevere? The same way you came to the Lord. You trust in the Lord. <laughs> it's always been in. How do you know if you're saved? You believe. <laughs> That's what believers are. We aren't like, hey, I believed and we're done. No, it's an ongoing, you, we believe. That's who we are. We are believers. Amen? We believe in Jesus Christ. We believed in him then. We believe in him now. And on that day, when we're seeing face to face, the ones who conquer, the ones who beat up other people, the ones who are militant, no, he's saying the ones who overcome the things I've just asked you to overcome, the ones who hear and do, guess what? Those are mine. Those are my people. Because they hear my voice and they follow what I say. I am their Lord. And on that day, guess what? You're going to taste salvation. This light and momentary affliction is going to turn into an eternal weight of glory. And he's going to use different idioms as he keeps going on with the different churches to show that, and talks about different ways that they would understand and they would get. That person I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. In other words, you will be there in heaven with me and you will have the, all the riches and the treasures that are yours in Christ Jesus that are laid out in Scripture and they are vast and innumerable. How encouraging. A lot for us to remember this morning, a lot for us to repent of this morning, a lot of us to redo this morning, and also a lot that we're encouraged in by the Lord. Amen? I look forward to being in this study with you guys, and so um, let's bow our heads in prayer, huh? Father, thank you so much for your word. May we be Lord, that church who, who hears your voice and who responds. Lord, show us what to do today. And may you be glorified in this place. And I pray that we would no longer operate in reaction and fear, Lord, but we would follow you in faith, God. And that we would reach out to one another. We would follow you into uncharted territories and jump into awesome things that you've called us to do that our love wouldn't grow cold it would be warm so father I just pray that you be glorified in this time and that your love would be felt in and among this church that we, yes, we would be know the word, but that love would just be manifested in a real profound way in the coming days. Forgive us, Lord, and, and, and strengthen us to do what is right and good in your sight. In the name of Jesus, amen.